Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddie Network podcast. My guest today is Bernie Borges, and I know nothing about who he is other than I know that he's had a podcast for 10 years, but other than that, I know nothing. And uh, this makes these first conversations very, um, very dynamic and interesting because we both will find out about the other. And that's, um, that's, a, that's a lesson for us all. So thank you for being here, Bernie, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and how you do it. And... Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, you know, that's always an interesting question. And I think about all the different sort of constituents in my life on how they would like me to answer that question. Uh, yeah. I think of my, yeah, I think of my church friends. They would say, they would want me to say that I'm a Christ follower, which I am. I think of my wife, she would want me to say that, you know, I'm her husband, which I am. Uh, my kids, Amanda and Derek, would want want them to say that I'm their dad, which I am. And then uh, anybody who cares about my vocation would would want to hear that I've been in content marketing for the better part of 30 years, specifically B2B, business to business. And as you mentioned, uh, I'm a, po- a podcaster. I've been podcasting for 10 years, not the same podcast for 10 years. <laughs> the podcast that I'm currently hosting, I've had for two years, but I've been a podcaster for 10 years. And um, I, I enjoy podcasting. It's just something being in front of a microphone and having these kinds of conversations is something that uh, I enjoy doing. It comes very natural to me. And most of the time I'm on your side, meaning I'm doing the interviewing. Yeah, so yeah. it's a, it's fun to be on the other side. Well, the way you introduced yourself, raised a question in my mind because it's something I'm thinking a lot about right now. And that has to do with identity. So you, you listed the various identities that you, um, let's say subscribe to for your, for yourself, but is there something about who you are that ties all of those things together in a meaningful way? I think it would be, um, just who I am in terms of how I treat people. Okay. Um, someone asked me recently if there was one word that you would want people to describe you by, what would that be? And I remember the answer I gave them, and I had to think about it for just a few seconds. Fortunately, it didn't take me too long, but the word is kind, meaning or kindness, mm-hmm. that I just try to be kind to people. Uh, you know, the old adage, you know, treat people the, the way you you want to be treated and, you know, kindness and respect and, you know, kind of showing love to people. Uh, and I know that, you know, I'm kind of getting deep very early in the conversation, but the point I'm getting at is just what ties it all together it really doesn't matter whether I'm doing a B2B content marketing project and I'm working with people, I'm treating them with respect and kindness. If I'm, um, you know, at the grocery store, because uh, between my wife and I, that's, um, we kind of divvy things up. And so I do the grocery shopping on the weekend. And as, as I encounter people, I remember just last week, you know, there's a lady who thought she was in my way. I said, no, you're fine. You're, you're fine right where you are. Just being, trying to be kind. So just anything, any scenario that I'm in, that's kind of my compass is just attempting. I'm not saying I always succeed, Ed, but I attempt. I want to be kind in every, every scenario. I would think that one of the ways to be that way is to practice not being judgmental of looking at people and in, in describing them in a certain way, which is pejorative and makes possibly makes you look good in, in your own mind. I'm, I'm better than them because they're this way. I mean, there's a lot of that kind of judgment that goes on in our world today. You know, you, you see it, you know, on the airways, you see it in the politics of the of the country or the politics of the globe, you know, and and so um, there's a lot of projection of people's own inner inner disquietness about themselves that they project on other people, and therefore that judgment is is really about uh, themselves. But what I hear you saying that this kindness is really a way of describing your own sense of peacefulness about your own life and your own self. So, yeah, I would agree with that. And I would 
also throw the the word humility into this conversation. I, I, I think I was raised to be humble. Uh, I came from a humble home. My parents were very humble, uh, mostly in the way they behaved, not necessarily saying you should be humble. They just taught me to be humble by the values that they taught me. I don't think I remember them saying you should be humble. It was just the 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 upbringing that they gave me and that's been with me all my life. So I think that humility makes it sort of natural. I don't have to think about, oh, I should be kind in this situation or I should I shouldn't be judgmental in this situation. I think it's just kind of in my DNA because I was raised to be humble. Yeah. You know, since I can remember. Well, you know, you you said you were a Christ follower, which I I celebrate with you. I'm a I'm a retired Presbyterian minister. And oh. And um, but that doesn't mean that I that doesn't mean that what that I'm that I'm necessarily kind or not judgmental or anything like that. It, it's it's just that was a part of the job that I did. But my faith informed that job. But what I learned is at a very young age um, about kindness and not being judgmental was that um, and that, and I can't you know. I would. I wish I could draw it from the scripture as I re, as I remember seeing this, uh, but it's somewhere in the Gospels that you know J Jesus says that that the Father doesn't judge. I am the only judge, you know, and we are not allowed to judge. And I, and I, so I thought, so what does that really mean? And I finally came to the conclusion that in all my relationships with people, um, I'm not to sit in judgment of who they are in relationship to me, I'd rather, I, I should look at them as um, in terms of, if Jesus was standing between us, I'm going to see them as Jesus sees them and he loves them. And so how do I look at these people, look at whoever they may be in such a way that I can love them? And that sounds a, a little um, squishy or you know, touchy feely, but it's really not. It's really about affirmation. It's sort of about kindness. It's really about believing in in people that they have something to offer to the world. All those sort of things kind of emerges from that. Yeah, and and I think by and large, with a rare exception, Ed, I believe that most people respond very favorably, very positively when you are showing kindness and not being judgmental. Yeah. Um, I, I, there's an incident that comes to mind that happened a few years ago, maybe five years ago. It was a neighbor of mine who had two very large dogs. I don't know what breed they are. I've never seen this breed before, even, even since then. I'm not talking just normally big dogs. I'm talking, these were like giant dogs. And my dog was the complete opposite of the very small little, um, drawing a blank on the name because he's, he's been gone for a couple of years. Anyway, I was out walking my dog and his two dogs were out unleashed. And one of them comes running across the street and I panicked. I thought, I mean, this dog could crush my dog in one bite. This dog was like a small horse. And I overreacted. I reacted very aggressively. And I remember what I said to the guys. I said, cause he was only about 30 feet away from me. I said, if I said, if if your dog kills my dog, I'm coming after you. It was in the heat of the moment. I mean, that was not kind, right? And so we had some words. And then I walked home with the dog and I thought to myself, that was wrong. I mean, I just behaved exactly the opposite of how I want to behave and should behave. So I went out and I walked over to him and I apologized to him. Yeah. I said, Hey, I'm sorry, man. I, I overreacted. I shouldn't have reacted that way. And we had a nice little chat after that. Um, but you know, in the moment I didn't like myself yeah. well, in the moment, it was just pure adrenaline <laughs> and emotion. But, you know, with just a few minutes of thinking about it, I decided that, it, you know, I, I needed to take action on what I had done and went back to him. So I guess what I'm saying is we're, as you know, Ed, we're not perfect, right? We're human. And that imperfection can show up any time. But if we have the mindset of, of wanting to be kind is sort of the natural behavior that we want as close to uh, as close to all the time as we can possibly get, 
then it, we at least we can kind of use that as our you know guiding principle. And then when we fail, we can just say, I'm sorry, if you have the opportunity. Sometimes you don't have that opportunity, but in this case, I had the opportunity, so I did. So have people responded to you, to you um, in, in uh, people have, have people responded to you um, in such a way that they have remarked on your kindness at being something unique and special? I, not really. It's not not like people react overwhelmingly. I think it's just honestly, Ed. I think the, the the reaction that I get mostly that is is the reaction that I want is just people smiling. You know, because you know, in kindness, I'm smiling. Like when the woman at the grocery store literally last weekend, I was going to I was I was going to get some onions, and she was right in the middle, right in front of them. And she moved her cart actually more in my way as I was going to them. She's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in your way. And I was like, don't worry about it. You're fine with a smile, right? And that automatically just brings a smile back, you know, from the person that you're smiling at. So it's not like people are saying, oh, you're kind. No, and and I'm not looking for that either. I, I'm, I'm looking for that just a, a human interaction that's a pleasant one. And every once in a while, you're going to encounter someone, you're just catching them on a bad day because people have bad days sure. and you may not get that reaction. Uh, and I get that, you know, but yeah, it's not words I'm looking for. It's more of just a, a positive interaction. Well, it, it strikes me that, that there is, I mean, this is, it's a distinctive way of being that is needed in the world today. I mean, I, I think about, um, say, walking into a business after hours event. I don't know if you've ever been to any of these kinds of things. You know, there are a lot of people around there, and they're all pitching their 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 business or their work or their or their who they are. As you know, they they want people to know that they're important, or at least they want us to believe that they know. They want us to believe that they think they that they are important. And and I find that those in those situations, you don't you don't really ex experience that kind of kindness that you're talking about because there's kind of a competitiveness that goes on with there. But what what I have found is you you go into those situations and you go to find out who are these people and how can I identify with them, and if if the topic comes up, then I'm going to tell them who I am but I'm really gonna show that I'm interested in them. And then if they're of a, of a mindset to respond positively, then they're gonna ask, so who are you? What, are you, what is it that you do? I mean, it's kind of like what we're doing here on, on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think- You know, there's, there's times and places for all kinds of activities, right? You're using yeah. the example of, you know, the speed dating from a networking standpoint mm -hmm. where yeah. you only have a few minutes to sort of pitch yourself. Uh, I mean, even in sporting contests, I'm a hockey fan. I was watching a part of um, the, the game last night between my Tampa Bay Lightning and the New York Rangers. And one of our players went down and had a very serious injury and he had to be carted off. Now, hockey is a very physical sport, very, very physical sport. And, and injuries are common. And you could see not only his teammates, but the other, the, the Rangers, you know, who are the opponents. They were all, you know, huddled around and they were uh, uh, slapping their sticks on the on the ice, which is, you know, uh, synonymous of, with clapping. Right. That's what they mean by that. Yeah. And even the crowd, which and the game was in New York. So we were the visiting team, even the crowd. So people you see it in all kinds of sporting events. Right. You've seen football and baseball, et cetera. When a player goes down, people feel bad about that, even in the middle of a, a very competitive sporting event. So I think it's much more common in human nature than I think we give it credit for, because unfortunately, whether it's the media or gossip or whatever it may be, we see so much bad news and violence and and you know unpleasant human behavior as opposed to the the pleasant human behavior that we're exposed to more naturally, more often. 
but unfortunately the the unpleasant human behavior is what really gets hyped and and uh and just you know all over the media and we just see too much of it i want to shift gears a little bit and talk about podcasting and how did you how did you enter into being a podcaster 10 years ago you know it was just one of those whims that uh, a buddy uh, uh, and i did um guy named chuck palm he and i he's a digital marketing geek and i say that lovingly he would chuckle at it and we just decided Let, let's give this thing a try it was 10 years ago it was fairly early days for podcasting so we just got on 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 mics and we just talked about digital marketing topics for 49 episodes so we did it for 49 episodes but here's the thing and we had no strategy it was it literally just we we're riffing on a variety of different topics on digital marketing. We had zero strategy, but we just kind of, you know, broke the ice. We just said, oh, let's kind of figure, th figure this out, you know, what, what's involved. And in those days, 10 years ago, it was harder to do podcasting than it is now, even from a technology standpoint. Well, people didn't know that you didn't have a strategy either. They just thought you were brilliant. I'm sure. Right. Right. No, you're right. You're right. Um, but it, I mean, back in, in those days, if I do the math right, um, yeah, so that would have been 2004, no, 2014, um, 2004 would have been 20 years ago. So, okay, so we had the iPhone, but I don't know that uh, iTunes was out then. I don't remember. I don't remember. And actually it was 2013, not 14. So I'm coming up on my 11th uh, anniversary. Um, but to answer your question, it was really a whim but it, it, I got, I got bit by the bug, and then that led me to the second podcast where I did have a strategy. So, but I'll pause there. I don't know if you want to go there. Yeah, I, I actually, I want to hear this. So, so what is your, okay. what was your strategy then? So, uh, again, I'm, a, I'm a marketing guy. I've been in, in B two B, digital marketing, content marketing for uh, the better part of more than twenty years, probably pushing thirty years. I haven't really done the math yet and i started a podcast uh when did i start it um 2008 17 i think it was uh, and i called it the modern marketing engine podcast and what i did was my strategy was i would interview marketing executives vps of marketing directors of marketing at mostly at um business to business you know b2b brands Right, And my strategy was to interview them for two reasons. One is to learn, you know, just interview them on specific topics and, and learn from that, but also to build relationships within the, the industry because I, I was in, well, still am in the marketing industry. And some of those relationships turned into clients. So the strategy was to learn, build relationships, and then wherever possible, where, where there was a fit, you know, try to build some business from it. And, and I was able to do all three learn and, you know, build some relationships. And by the way, by those relationships that I don't necessarily mean that they all became buddies and we stayed in touch on a regular basis, but there is something about this intimate medium that even a year after the, the interview, I could ping them and just say, Hey, and then maybe tell them about an event or something that I'm hosting, you know, something to that effect. And, you know, they would, they would receive it, generally speaking, receive it well, right? Because there was a little bit of a relationship. There are others that actually did turn into relationships where we stayed in touch regularly and then, and even some that actually turned into client relationships. So, and that podcast, I retired in 2021 at episode 300. So on episode 300, I actually um, announced that the podcast was retiring I covered a topic and I just bid everyone farewell and said, just watch for me on some of some future podcast, which happened in 2022. And it's not a podcast about marketing. So I'll pause there and so give you a chance to jump in. Yes. Um, well, what you're, what you're doing is you're basically allowing yourself to interact with people on things that you're interested in. And, and with a purpose to extend the reach of your own ideas to them while connecting with their ideas so that maybe there is 
some synergy that comes with that. I think that's that's a really the one of the most valuable things about doing a podcast is it, it because you're you're meeting people for the first time in many cases and and you're finding that you have you share things in common and uh, which is a which is really a fantastic thing. Yeah. Now the marketing podcast, there's something that I did that I don't know if it was unique, but it was something that I did as a regular matter of practice. It was an SOP for me. And that is every guest that I interviewed, I insisted, and I never got pushback on having a prep call first. Oh, and the purpose of the prep call, Ed, is primarily to prepare so that we prepared the talk, the, the, the main topic and some talking points. Additionally, it was also an opportunity to begin building the relationship. So then the podcast recording happened on a separate date and time. So I had two interactions with them. I had the prep call and then the podcast recording. And I, 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 I heard very often Ed from, from people, the guests, at the end of the podcast recording, I often heard them say, you know, I really appreciate uh, how how you prepped for this. Mm-hmm. Not just me, because I did prep. I, I, you know, I wouldn't come cold. I would know something about them, their company, because they were they were head of marketing at a company. But the prep call, it made it gave them gave them confidence that we have a plan, that they're not they're not going to be put on the spot with something that they're unprepared to discuss that they know what it is that we're going to discuss. And so that was also part of my strategy. And it was very effective because again, to a person, they were really appreciative of the opportunity to do the prep and then the opportunity to be well prepared for the podcast so that they can shine. Yeah. You know, I always said to them, you know, like, Hey, this, this episode is about you. I'm featuring you and your thought leadership. And I would even tell them because again, they were heads of marketing at a company I would tell them, look, I want this to be good for your company. Right. I also want it to be good for you, your personal brand. So, you know, maybe that's a form of kindness coming through, but it was part of my strategy to just let them know that I, I want this experience to be good for you and for, for the brand that you represent. Because in many cases, they represented that brand for some period of time and then they moved on, right, to another brand. That's just kind of the nature of uh, marketing careers. Uh, but that was the strategy and it was, it was pretty effective. Um, I see the value in that, particularly if you're going to be dealing with specific technical knowledge of a particular field, you know, like marketing, I think I see the real value in that. And, um, you know, what I, what I'm doing here is the the real opposite of that. Yeah. 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 But at the same time, I'm going to, I want my guests to feel like, they have been respected and they have been able to present themselves in the very best, best light. And I've had one, maybe two people that have at the end of, and at the, at the end of things, they felt like that was not, not the case. But so out of now 106 that have um, posted, if only one or two or felt like I didn't do it, didn't do a good job of serving them, then um, I think I'm doing okay. But it's I, because here's what here's what I see, and I and, and this is not the, this is not competitive anyway, because I think both of these models, both these methodologies or approaches are really valuable. But I want people to to show who they are as a normal person, you know, and and show the things that they that matter to them, share the things that that they value. And tell tell the story which kind of communicates this is who this person is and this is why I will learn to respect you because not because there's some kind of uh, analytical reason for it but because you've really shown us something about yourself that's really uh, uh, something interesting to um, to um, to learn about you so that's that's yeah I can I can see doing what you're doing. Um, I, if I had done what you would do, I should have done that about 10 years ago, you know, uh, before I wrote my book and then it would have been useful for writing the book because of what I'd learned from people who are specifically thought, thought leaders in the leadership world. But I, I, you know, my, my client or my 
guest list is pretty broad and um, all, kind of encompassing all the world. So that is interesting. So what's this? What's the uh, podcast you're doing now? So my current podcast, which is two years old, is the Midlife Fulfilled podcast. So I was in between podcasts after I retired the Modern Marketing Engine podcast in 2021. I went about six to nine months where I was in between and I was kind of itching for my next podcast. And I knew I didn't want to do another podcast about marketing. I just feel like I'd done that. And because of the season of life that I'm in, I just started thinking about something around midlife. So I did a bunch of research, Ed, and I found hundreds of podcasts about midlife. And 99% of them are hosted by women for women. Yeah. And, and they're hosted by women and for women uh, on topics that are women only topics, mm -hmm. you know, menopause, you know, dealing with health and fitness, the way that they need to deal with it as women. Yeah. And of course, nothing wrong with that, but I didn't find very many, I mean, really like a handful of podcasts that were uh, for both men and women. I found a few podcasts that were for midlife men, but I didn't want to make any distinction and then in parallel, I was doing some research around like the meaning of midlife and what are people you know, struggling with. And of course, midlife crisis is like the most searched phrase around midlife. And I stumbled across the happiness U-curve. Are you familiar with the happiness U-curve or U-happiness curve? You, you familiar with that? It sounds familiar, but I think you need to refresh my memory. So U stands for the letter U, not the word U, the letter U, right? So it looks like this right? We all know what a U looks like. And it was a study that was published in 2020 uh, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, I think is uh, the outfit, not a government agency, a think tank. And they studied across many countries and what they discovered that globally, people, humans are happiest at age 18. So that's a, the top of the one part of the U. And then we become less happy and we are the least happy at age 47.2. Go figure, 47.2. And then we start to get happy again, all the way up into our 90s. Yeah. So we're we're happiest at age 18. We we keep getting less and less happy. We're at least happy at 47.2, and then become happy again in the rest of our life. But what that led me to was, what's the meaning of happiness? And somewhere in there, I stumbled across fulfillment, and I decided that there's nobody talking about fulfillment. People were talking about happiness and other, other aspects of midlife, but nobody was talking about fulfillment. So I came up with my own definition of fulfillment and I, you know, tested it against what's written out there. And I really haven't found anybody to just refute me explicitly. But to me, I define fulfillment as something that we feel that is immutable as a result of some achievement. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I've broken our midlife into five pillars so that instead of us trying to look at our life and examine where we are and are in fulfillment in life, that's kind of like boiling the ocean. I say, let's look at our life across five pillars. And those five pillars are health, fitness, career, relationships, and legacy. So again, health, fitness, career, relationships, and legacy. And by the way, someone asked me, well, where's re re uh, religion? I said, that's in relationship. Yeah. So <clears throat> if we can look at our life across those five pillars, then inst instead of trying to boil the ocean, then we can just really examine where are we fulfilled? And I always use the following example, and it's a hypothetical one, but it's, a, it's one that kind of illustrates the point. Imagine a, a college professor who achieves tenure. It's a big deal. College professors who achieve tenure, it took them many years and a lot of hard work to achieve tenure. Professionally speaking, that college professor must be very fulfilled. But what if that college professor goes home at night to either a broken relationship or no relationship? So in their relationship bucket, they're going to be unfulfilled, but in their career, they might be very fulfilled. And that's just a simple example of looking at our life across these five pillars. You can say the same thing as he with health. Your career might be great. Your relationships might be great, but your health is in poor condition for reasons, by the way, that you can control. 
because mm-hmm. there, there are certainly reasons for poor health that we can't control. We know that. Right. But in many cases, they are self-imposed health problems. So on the podcast, what I do is I interview people that either tell a fulfillment story, a very personal fulfillment story, at the end of which they usually tell me after the recording, Bernie, that was like a therapy session, even though that's not the intent, but it kind of comes across that way because they're telling a, a fulfillment story that you know listeners can resonate to. Um, or I, I interview someone who teaches or informs, and I call that a maximum episode. So the fulfillment stories are BF to AF stories, before fulfillment to after fulfillment. And then the maximum episodes are someone that has some expertise on a topic that's relevant to any, any of us in our midlife season, and they inform or teach. And so they're not telling a fulfillment story or personal story. They're teaching on some topic like financial planning or health or fitness or something career related, et cetera. So I'm 155 episodes in as of the recording you and I are doing. I'm publishing two episodes a week. Monday is the guest episode. Thursday, I do a solo episode where I I summarize my takeaways from the guest episode. And uh, I love that episode, Ed, because I just do a deep reflection. I'm, I'm kind of a writer, not as prolific as you, meaning I don't put out the kind of volume you put out. But what I do is I, 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 I look at, not look at, I, I sit down with the guest episode and then I kind of summarize the key, three key discussion points. And then my brain just hones in on one of them. And then I just start typing away, you know, my thoughts about it and it just flows. I mean, it just flows. And then I do a whole takeaway episode on, on that, what that flowed out of my head on, on, for example, the most recent one I interviewed a woman who it was a maximum episode where she's a, a debt elimination coach. She coaches people, mostly women, on how to eliminate debt. One of the things that she coaches her her people on is to start small and and just take small steps, but be consistent. Mm-hmm. And so when I summarized the, the the three key discussion points, that was the third point. And I honed in on that. And that really just took me to what that concept really is, which is incremental progress. Mm -hmm. I did a little Google search on it and there's tons of research on incremental progress. There's studies been done on incremental progress. And then it dawned on me, Ed, I have been doing incremental progress for decades. The podcast that I'm doing, because I have a full-time job. So my podcast, I do an hour or two a day, usually in the evening, and then four to six, maybe 10 hours max on the weekend. And it that's not a lot of hours per week, but it's incremental progress. Mm-hmm. So every episode is either a fulfillment story that's usually emotional, personal, or something that's teaching that uh, that anyone in midlife can get some kind of valuable insight from. It's really fascinating because what you're what you're saying is par- parallel with what I've discovered over almost 40 years of doing leadership work, but in particular over the last almost 30 years um, from when I began as a consultant. And what I found was, you know, if you're, if you're a minister, you're trained to be a minister. You, and one of the things you're trained to do is be able to, to interact with people in a, in a meaningful level, you, cause you're, you're going to have moments where you're doing pastoral care and you're having basically therapy sessions. And if you're, having those kinds of conversations with your clients, they're telling you things. And I would, I would describe myself as the intimate outsider. And so I'm going to know things about you and your business that it will never, nobody else will ever know, but I will know, and I will be able to help you with this, you know, and it's not that I'm, you know, um, special in that regard. This just the, the, the relationship that forms between a consultant and a, and a business owner, for example, that's what happens. And what I, what I began to see was that there was this trend line and it, it, it may be a, a function of the youth, but I found that, you know, when people, you know, the finish high school, go to college, it's such an exciting, exhilarating time, feel like the future is open to them and they go, they go get their first job. And then they spend maybe 20 years in that first job. And all of a sudden things begin to change. 
And it's not that they're ha happy, um, but the company may have changed, that maybe the company's values have changed. And so all of a sudden you, you don't feel quite as settled. And I think this is more true earlier now than it used to be. And what I was finding is that people in their 40s, that, that this was a transition moment for them. And, and that and much of the book is, you know, is, is fit, um, focused on this idea of, of that we're all in transition all the time. But for these people in their 40s, they're, they're having to make decisions about the next 20 or 30 years of their career. What am I going to, where do I want to be when I retire? Um, you know, and some people say, well, I want to retire at 55. You know, others are saying, I don't ever want to retire. I'm going to work until I die. I mean, I'll, but people had these different notions about what they wanted to do. And, uh, and so they were going through these transitions. And I found that I myself was going through the same transition. So when I was when I became a consultant, I had just I was in my early forties, and so, <laughs> and then I realized, gosh, this is my story. You know, it's my story, and uh, and so that so those conversations about what you're talking about, those five things, were were riddled all the way through all these relationships that I've had over the all these years. Then last summer, I hit my seventieth birthday. And I'm not one to celebrate birthdays, but I decided I'm going to celebrate this as a as a landmark milestone birthday. And I actually had three different birthday parties, and because I wanted I wanted the people that I cared about to feel like they were a part of this moment for me. And so I began to describe this as my as that as the beginning of my third half of life. And and because I now. I'm doing what I'm doing now with the podcast and stuff is totally different than the consulting, totally different than the ministry I did before the consulting, totally different than everything I've done up till this point. And um, and I now I, I'm looking 30 years into the future and saying, okay, for and these these blocks of time really take up about 30, 35 years. So I'm looking at the next 30 to 35 years. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna live to 105, but I'm gonna do I have a purpose. And a desire for fulfillment over those thirty years. Exactly. <clears throat> so the the other uh, that that's great. I thank you for sharing uh, part of your story. That's uh, that's really helpful for me. You know, the other thing that I talk about with respect to fulfillment is that fulfillment is immutable. So I I, I like to draw a distinction between happiness and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. There's there's a little bit of overlap. You mm -hmm. can you can be happy and fulfilled. For a number of reasons but there's also an aspect of happiness that could be very temporary if yeah. my favorite sports team wins especially a very close game i'm happy immediately afterwards but the next day i'm kind of on with my day and not really thinking that much about it fulfillment is immutable just using the example i gave before a tenured college professor once that college professor has reached that tenure status there's nothing that can take away that that feeling of fulfillment. It is immutable. And, and so that's a huge distinction between fulfillment and happiness. And so it, it offers us perspective so that when we look at those five pillars, again, health, fitness, career relationships, and legacy, we can examine how fulfilled are we in each of those five pillars. And because in our midlife seasons, which I loosely define as over age 40, and by the way, I don't put in uh, a number on on the the other extreme. Yeah. I don't say it's 40 to X. I'll come back to that because I want to elaborate on that a little bit. Remind me to come back to that because hey, I like talking hey, about that. I want to hear that. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the point that I'm getting at is when, when you're looking at each one of those pillars, uh, we've had so much life experience that it's normal for us to say we're not 100% filled, fulfilled in, in any of those pillars right. or, or maybe in some but not all of those pillars because there's been so much activity in our life, whether it's our health or our fitness or our career or our relationships or legacy. And Ed, I find that a lot of people in our age range, I'm just a few years younger than you, just a few, the, the pillar that we're most focused on, and I'm not going to speak for you, but I'm just saying anecdotally, a lot of people that are in our age range, the pillar they're most focused on is legacy. What's the impact you want to have, right? 
that mm -hmm. is the pillar that I find most people in our age range are focused on. So how do you, how do you define legacy? What, what is that? So I'll define legacy in two ways. One, I'll give you a little definition, then I'll just explain how I'm chasing legacy fulfillment, right? To, to give you my personal story on that. So legacy is, again, it's what's the impact you want to have on fill in the blank. So I'm going to fill in the blank for you for me. So I want to have the, the best impact on my wife, my, my, who's my, my immediate spouse and my, my one and only wife, only been married once, 36 years, my two adult children, their spouses and our grandchildren. Right. So that's my immediate family. I don't have any siblings and my parents are deceased. So my immediate family is my wife, my, and my kids and their families. Mm -hmm. Right. That's one aspect of, of, I want to have the best impact that I can have, can have on them. And that's, any combination of financial as well as just love and kindness, like we were discussing earlier, helping them any way that I can help them. I mentioned that I recently helped my son move. By the way, he lives in Pennsylvania, I live in Florida. I flew up to help him move. And he was immensely grateful for that. And I volunteered. He didn't ask me. He did not ask me. Right. Anyway, the other category or other area that I want to have an impact on is People who listen to my podcast, people who want to understand how they can find more fulfillment mm -hmm. and become more self-aware as a result of listening to my podcast. So I want to get as many people listening to the podcast and, and benefiting from it. And then the third one is an individual, a 28 year old man whom I've known since he was a kid. He was actually really good friends with my son. Ironically, they don't talk to each other now. Um, which is very ironic, but I have a mentor mentee relationship with him. Uh, I know, and I don't want to get too personal, but I know that he doesn't have a very close relationship with his biological father and he and I have developed a bond. And so I'm mentoring him and, and I get tremendous fulfillment from that. And I, you know, what else happens, Ed, in my relationship with him, my conversations with him, I learn from him too. Yeah. He's an intelligent 28 year old man you know, who, who's going through his, his own life, you know, personal things, professional things. And, and yes, I give him a lot of counseling, but again, he's an intelligent guy and I learned from him as well. So I want to have a positive impact on him. So those are the three areas that I'm, uh, I'm focused on my, um, my, my legacy fulfillment pillar. And I share those with you. I share those, um, you know, it's, uh, to me, the le legacy is about your relationships, ultimately. What what has changed in your relationships because of of your love, kindness, mentorship, or whatever it may be, your relationship with people that remains after you're gone. And um, I saw I saw a um, a political ad to, this afternoon. You know, um, guy running for political office. And I recognized the last name, but I recognized it from a, no, a different town that I had lived in. And if he's related to that family, then one of the members of that family had been an elected official in the town where we used to live. And I wondered about where that person was now, if and whether there was any legacy to her life because of her service as a an elected official of the community. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know that, but it, but that's what crossed my mind this afternoon as I saw that, I saw that sign and, and, um, and I remember her, I mean, I knew her and I remember her with, um, as a, a strong leader, you know, but that's not to me, that's not her legacy. That's just a reputation, but the legacy right. is something that has changed that you, that you leave behind when you go. Yeah, it's it's what you're remembered by and again how you impacted someone mm -hmm. or a cause or a community. Again, it's you know, what's the impact you want to have on fill in the blank? And that's that's something personal to each each and every one of us. Let's come back to that point that you wanted to make earlier. Yes, thank you. So I, I, I like to point out that in the English language, there are many euphemisms, euphemisms, and one of them is we park in a driveway and we 
drive in a parkway. And the only reason I use that as a point of reference is that midlife is not a midpoint in life. It is not meant to be literal, just like we don't, we don't, we, we park in a driveway and we drive in a parkway, right? So likewise, the word mid life is not meant to be literal as in a midpoint in life. Right. Think about the logic behind that, Ed. Who knows when they're going to die? And if you don't know when you're going to die, then you can't say that you're at a midpoint in life. That's right. A lot of people might say that 40 or 45 is their midpoint, but they're assuming they're going to live to 90 or 95 or whatever, whatever the math is, right? And so I define midlife, and I've done some research on this, and there really isn't a very concrete, black and white, universally accepted definition of midlife, especially based on any kind of research. I've not found any. I found things like, oh, it's generally between 40 and 60 or 70. I think we have three phases in life in general. Youth, generally up to about age 30, generally. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to skip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to end of life. Mm -hmm. End of life is when we enter a period of decline in health that is a permanent decline in health that results in our death. Right. I witnessed that with both of my parents. When they got into their early 90s, they began a rapid decline in their health. And within three years, they passed away. Now, we, we probably all know people who have suddenly and unexpectedly and sadly passed away through either accident or illness. That's usually not an end of life scenario because it's very sudden and unexpected. I'm talking about just a natural decline in health where we pass away, which generally is in an older age. Right. Everything between youth and that end of life is, is what I consider to be midlife phases. And simply speaking, there's early, mid, and late midlife stages mm -hmm. early is 30s 40s ish mid is you know 50s 60s late midlife is you know 70 to whatever age we begin hey. to decline in age i i have a good friend who's 91 years old and he's healthy and he's sharp and he's brilliant and he's fully in midlife his health is good everything about him right and he's 91 so that's how I define midlife. And that's why I say I don't put an age to it other than that characterization of the only thing after midlife is that end of life season that we all experience eventually yeah. if we don't die suddenly. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with you. And I, you know, part of what I've been fighting, not, it's not because I needed to fight, but I, it's just a conception that people have about their lives is that they, um, they have a short period of time where they are to be effective in life, you know, which is that career age and that before and after is not really about being, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a whatever, wherever you want to call it. And, uh, it's, what I realize is that for many of us, we don't really begin to do our best work until after 60. I'm doing my best work now in my 70s. And um, I'm right there with you, Ed. I'm in my 60s and I feel like I'm at the top of my game. I, I'm, I'm with you 100%. And so it changes my outlook on how I should spend my days. You know, health is a big part of that. And, mm -hmm. and so I've never been, I've never been sick. I mean, when I say I've never been sick, I've never been sick. And, um, and then two and a half years ago, I was going to the beach, you know, and uh, spent the night on the road, got up the next morning, and I had no hearing in my right ear. Sudden hearing loss, which is a which is a thing. Turns out, a long story made very short, I have a, an acoustic neuroma that is attached to my vestibular nerve. So not only do not have hearing, but also have poor balance. And um, so I have to be very careful. And then, um, and that created um, 
the conditions where I couldn't do the kinds of uh, activities I was doing before because I'd, I'd fall down. I mean, it's that kind of thing. And then last summer, um, I went to the physical therapist that my neurosurgeon for my ear uh, recommended me, wanted to go to see about my, my balance. And she made some recommendations. So I, I start that and immediately it triggers the the deterior the the complete deterioration of my left hip, and and so now I'm you know I'm preparing in two months to have hip replacement surgery. Oh wow! And and, I, and tomorrow I go to see a spine specialist to see about some issues with my with my spine, you know some nerve issues. So these are all things that happened, you know sixty nine seventy, and you know and. And so those are biomechanical things. They're not health things. They're biomechanical. And right. So once I get these resolved, I, I now know what I'm going to do differently than I have been doing for the previous 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that leads me to why I make a distinction between health and fitness. Uh -huh. They're related. There's no question about it. You know, when you have a good fitness regimen and it's a part of your life, it contributes to your health. But you could can also be diabetic and have a great fitness routine and still be diabetic. Right. right. So, and as I said earlier, there are things that you can control in your health and there's things that you can't control in, in, in your health, but there is a distinction. And unfortunately, Ed, in the U S 60% of Americans don't do the minimum, which can consider to be the minimum requirement for exercise. Right. Which contributes to obesity and heart disease and diabetes and probably a laundry list of other, uh, you know, health issues. So, so yeah, I mean, everybody wants to be healthy. And when, when you have a health issue and I have some of my own, uh, it, it impacts us in many ways and it can really skew the things that are important that we thought were important to us are suddenly not as important to us because this other thing is a higher priority. Right. You know, so. It's, yeah. it is fascinating. So you, um, you're an example. Let me suggest that you're an example, not for people to model in some kind of honorific way, but actually, okay, this is how I've approached things. I've, I've constantly changed what I did, what I do. Uh, you change, you've done three different podcasts in 10 years. I mean, that's a, that's a significant set of changes there because you, they require effort. They require work. They require planning. And the fact that you've done three of these, it's like starting three different businesses in a, in a 10 year span. So I congratulate you on that. And, and I think what you're doing now is really valuable. And I hope that people will um, learn from you. And um, and and make changes in their life where they can establish a legacy that will be valuable um, long after they're gone. So, do you? Uh, I want to end, end with this question: Do you have a defined purpose to your life? Do you have a statement of purpose that you have that you have carried kind of with you for a long time? You know, it's a great question. Uh, I, I would have to say that I, I don't have a prepared, rehearsed statement of purpose. That said, I know that at this point in my life, I, I want to do things that impact fulfillment for me across the five pillars and legacy being the, the most important one to me. So if I was to turn that into a purpose, it would be to to have a legacy impact on the three areas of my life that I describe my immediate family, people who listen to my midlife fulfilled podcast. And currently the one gentleman that I mentioned that I, I mentor. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, it's a very clear purpose and it, it, it drives your mission in all the things that you do. Those, the, those things that you do are the mission that is derived from that purpose. And, and I think that's a, it's a way of looking at that. And uh, I, th I think that's fantastic. So, well, 
I'm grateful that you have been on here. I'm glad to know you. Um, you've encouraged me. You've really encouraged me um, and given me a sense of um, that I'm um, approaching things in, a, in the right way. And uh, that's that encouragement is really important. And I thank you. Well, thank you, Ed. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed our conversation. And thank you for the 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 compliment that um, that this conversation has been an encouragement to you. That's that's touching, and I uh, appreciate that very much. Well, I hope. Uh, and so, what what I would like to know. The last thing I'd like to know is how do people find your podcast? Sure, it's it's Midlife Fulfilled is the name of the podcast. I have a website, and it's midlifefulfilled dot com. All right. Well, we'll put that in the show notes so that people can find you. And I hope that they will find the same encouragement that I have in, in listening to you today. And thank you for, for being with us. And thank you all for watching. And please sign up and give us a like button, like check. And um, in particular, leave us a comment and let us know what you think. And uh, so that we can, we can be encouraged by you. And may you find a way to uh, find fulfillment in your life at whatever age you are and know that that is a possibility throughout your whole life, which that's a, which is actually a very thrilling thought to imagine that you can do that. Oh, I, I want to say one more thing. So um, you, you'll love this. So I've returned my to my home community where I grew up. I've been gone for basically 50 plus years. And so I've gone back to my home church and I was um, leaving church a couple of weeks ago and, and the, this couple came up to me and they looked like my age. I know who they are because they were neighbors of mine and they were in such good health. I mean, they were just moving like, you know, they were just like, they had all kinds of vitality. And, and I asked them, says, you know, we, we were catching up because we hadn't seen each other in so long. I said, so how old are you, are you all? She says, oh, we're 96. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. And yeah. And I said, so the stories they could tell and the people that they've influenced. And uh, I look forward to, to uh, getting together with them. I want to talk with them about uh, not so much what their secret is, because I think there's a lot of things that we don't have control over, but what is it that they've that has motivated them throughout their life? And um, yeah. And to be able to see that over time, that so I, I thought you'd like that. And uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. I I, I love examples like that. Uh, I want to hear more of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, everyone. Thank you again and again and again, and appreciate your your uh, watching. And we'll see you next time here on the Eddie Network podcast. Bye bye.